Dialogue at the Wilson Center is a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. And now here's your host, John Molusky. Hello and welcome to the Wilson Center in Washington, D.C. Each week, Dialogue explores the world of ideas and issues in international affairs, history, and culture. Diplomacy is certainly a frequent topic of discussion on this program, and our roster of guests over the years has included its fair share of ambassadors, current and former. But not all diplomacy is carried out by diplomats and government officials. Today we're going to discuss the idea of people-to-people -people diplomacy, particularly about the variety achieved through international exchange programs. Our guests are Mary Dean Connors, Director of the Office of Citizen Exchanges for the U.S. Department of State's Bureau of Cultural and Educational Affairs. Dan Davidson, President of the American Councils for International Education, which conducts a number of exchange programs involving students, scholars, and professionals from around the world. And our final guest was one of those student exchange program participants. Rosa Vasilova is from St. Petersburg, Russia. She attended a U.S. high school in Minnesota back in 2003 as a participant in the Future Leaders Exchange Program. Welcome to Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Mary, let me begin with you and ask you about, it. in the big uh, charge, the big mission of the State Department, mm -hmm. how do exchanges fit into the picture? Well, I think ex it's clear exchanges are the heart and soul of public diplomacy. And everyone's interested in public diplomacy these days. Uh, and people-to-people -people exchanges are really uh, the tool of public diplomacy that seem to have the greatest effect and the most long-lasting effect on uh, international relations, where we bring Americans together with other people and they have a chance to meet each other, especially when they're young, uh, when we talk about youth exchange. And these are ties that last their entire lives. So this isn't viewed as a nice thing to do. This is mission critical. It's totally mission critical. And I think uh, the funding we've received over the past decades to do this and the large number of alumni we have now and what they're doing overseas, especially in key areas, key areas like volunteerism and uh, community outreach, are going to have long lasting effects on their countries. Does, does this uh, enjoy bipartisan support? Yes, it, ha it does. Some of, some of our best programs or our largest programs, FLEX and YES, which uh, are acronyms for a program, uh, Future Leader Exchange, and Youth Education, um, or, um, you know, for different parts of the world, but they were uh, funded by um, or supported by senators from both Democrat and Republican parties. Great. And Dan, tell us about the types of exchanges that American Councils conducts. American Council's focus is on the education side because just as this is critical for U.S. foreign affairs interests, it's equally uh, cr uh, critical for uh, the preparation of a new generation of Americans for the 21st century. Uh, this is not about just a local education. People who want to succeed in the 21st century have to think in global terms. They have to be aware of all parts of the world, not just some parts of the world. And so for us, uh, we see a central educational mission and a very interesting coincidence of mission between the education side and the foreign affairs mm -hmm. side uh, through our partnership with the State Department. We focus on high school students and their teachers, undergraduate students, faculty, researchers, graduate students, and professionals. Because in a sense, education is lifelong. And there's really no particular point where you, where you stop thinking about the world. So the, the nature of what's exchanged is yeah. both cultural, educational, uh, are there other uh, categories that we should be listing as well? Well, uh, I think you can argue that... Experiential, that, uh, I guess. Exactly right. Experience is, is part of it. Ultimately, the transformation of people into global citizens is, is, is a goal. Uh, it has to do with maintaining peace and mutual understanding around the world. And that is, that's a process that never changes. It's, it's, it's broadening our perspective, whatever we are, whatever our, whether we work in public affairs or whether we work in the private sector or in the third sector or in journalism or in government or in the military or in commerce or in the area of, of, of innovation. Uh, the, the richness that is out there right now is probably best harvested through international collaboration today, that kind of broad circulation of ideas, including entrepreneurial ideas. I don't want to gloss over something you just said, which may have been lost in the casual way we are discussing this, but you said, talked about, and it, it, correct me, the exact language, maintaining peace or encouraging peace? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is not just the, the work of uh, ambassadors in arms negotiations or something like that. This, you actually see this as important in maintaining peace around the globe, or even making peace in some cases. I think you can argue that, that the, 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 the better we understand people with perspectives other than our own, the easier it is to establish dialogue. Uh, 
dialogue uh, around issues uh, in, in which we don't fully agree is far and away a better way to address conflicts in some cases to resolve them in some ways to, to some cases to, to at least to mitigate conflict uh, it's a far better and far less expensive way uh, from human and economic costs than the other way the military way mm -hmm. uh, Rosa, I'm, as we sit here talking about you indirectly, since you are a participant in this whole matrix, uh, let's backtrack first and tell us about the program you participated in and how you came to uh, mm -hmm. visit the United States as an exchange student. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my journey in the international exchange um, started uh, in 2003 when I participated in the FLEX program, which mm -hmm. stands for Future Leaders Exchange, uh, which is also known as Freedom Support Act before uh, 2003. Um, and it's a one-year high school exchange program uh, sponsored by the Department of State and uh, administered by the American Councils. I came uh, to a small town of Cannon Falls in Minnesota, and I spent a year and I lived with the American, high school, uh, American uh, host family. I went to American high school. Um, and. Um, I became a, an alumna of this program. Um, the program brings um, to the United States over a thousand students uh, from Eurasia each year. And um, Now we say Eurasia now, when the program first began, we were talking about the former Soviet Union because mm -hmm. this was essentially a child of the end of the Cold War. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and when you came on the program, I'm just curious what your mindset was. D did you see yourself as a, a pre people to people ambassador? Did you understand what the expectations were for you? Well, um, somewhat, yes, of course, because uh, before we come on the program, we have a pre-departure orientation where we explain the goals of the program. And we have this clear idea in mind that we are ambassadors of our culture, uh, our countries. Um, I don't think everybody uh, fully realizes what the role is before we actually come to uh, on the program and um, you know the um, main idea is that you maintain this positive attitude open-mindedness and you you present your culture through yourself so if you are being uh, who you are and you're a nice positive person I feel that um, this is how you convey uh, your role as an ambassador already. And, and generally speaking, was your experience, was it easy to achieve what you just described? Or was it difficult? Were there bumps in the road? Well, um, nothing is always easy. And uh, of course, there were bumps. And uh, you know, I had, I had a personally, uh, this was a year of uh, personal growth, first mm, of all. I imagine it would and be. Uh, you come to a completely different environment, and you uh, go through um, significant changes, and you learn a lot about yourself, about the community, about the family and this is also one of the goals of the program to mm -hmm. um, make us stronger and uh, make us uh, better leaders um, but as far as uh, my uh, my goals as an ambassador of the of my con uh, co country I didn't think it was difficult you know I was uh, very positive I um, had a lot of presentations about Russia. I talked to people, and it very pleases me that after I leave, you know, people who are there in the community, they say, "Oh, we know this Russian girl," and they portray <laughs> my my country through this, through the things that I've achieved in the community. I was very active. I participated in a lot of community events, and um, I, you know, I feel that um, in that regard, it wasn't hard because um, you know the students who are chosen for the program it's a it's a big competition and they have the potential to be uh, true ambassadors true uh, representatives of the uh, country and you still have a relationship with your host family oh definitely this is uh, mm -hmm. um, they are my true second family and they actually came uh, all the way to Syracuse they drove from Minnesota t for my graduation which was uh, magnificent and uh, we maintain very close relationship not only with that my uh, host family but um, I have other uh, very close friends in the community who I uh, keep in touch constantly and um, you know uh, then has your host family ever uh, met your Russian family your real family it was actually it happened this year on my graduation for, uh, from my master's program and it was very um, very touching moment uh, my host dad cried and he said now I see um, how Rosa became who she is and it, it was a very touching right. moment mm -hmm. yes. well there's there's the uh, the domino effect this uh, spreads beyond the the participants uh, Mary you mentioned the yes program as well and uh, we're all familiar with that but for the sake of our viewers and listeners could you talk about the history of that and how it relates to the, sure. the success of flex yes yes was uh, created in the aftermath of 9-11 um, supported by Senator Kennedy and Senator Luger and it's an, an academic year exchange program for students from Muslim-majority countries. And uh, it's, uh, it's 
50 countries are actually now involved in the program, and there are six or 7,000 alumni of the program since it started um, about 10 years ago. In the case of uh, Flex and Yes, the, yeah. the inspiration for each mm -hmm. and the problem being mm -hmm. solved or addressed is, is fairly evident. Is that always the case in the type of exchange programs you're involved with, in, or do some have a more general mission? Well, I think they, I, I think, you know, mutual understanding and uh, as Rosa said and as Dan said, you know, we want to understand other people's cultures, but we want them to understand our culture too. It's really a true way, a two-way street mm -hmm. to make things happen. So an academic year studying in the United States under U.S. government auspices is incredible. And uh, as Rosa also said, it's extremely competitive. It's as hard to get a flex or yes scholarship as it is to get into Harvard. If you look at the wow. numbers uh, of students who apply and, and, and uh, you know, how few are accepted. But let's Luckily not. Luckily, not as expensive as getting into Harvard. No, well, no, it's not. <laughs> no, we students. pinch At every penny the in the U.S. government. Are you kidding? <laughs> but it's also important to remember there are 40,000, perhaps, uh, students who come for an academic year study in the United States that are really come under private auspices. Some pay, uh, some might believe are supported by foundations. So we have about 2,000 a year. So we're, in, in one sense, a small slice, but we think we're really a very, very important slice because these students are the future leaders. You know, they come here as, as student ambassadors and they are the global leaders of tomorrow. Dan, you didn't use the word globalization, but I was thinking it as you were mm -hmm. talking about mm -hmm. the increasing imperative for a, a smaller world for people to know each other. So as a result of that, are, is the amount of activity in the exchange world increasing? Absolutely, and, and you can look at that from different, uh, d with different kind of measuring sticks in your hand. One is to see the contribution and impact of the growing number of international students in our high schools, our undergraduate colleges and universities, uh, and the graduate schools, uh, some of which are supported by the federal government and some of which simply pay on their own, own to be here. But the contribution of those international students and faculty to American education is just remarkable. And that's, I think, an important part of the discussion we're having right now. It's logical to think about the exchangees themselves, whether they be from overseas or whether they be U.S. citizens going overseas. But the other side of that is, as Rosa was hinting, is, is the impact on host communities, on the family, on the siblings within that family, uh, on the, on the world-changing nature, if you will, life-changing nature of the presence of those international uh, students and, and faculty in, our, uh, in and among our communities. How are those host communities? Uh, host family selected? Uh, how does someone, if, if someone's listening or watching who'd like to become one, how do they, how do they get involved? Well, that, that is a very I've got a website. <laughs> right. What hosting. is the website? What is the website? Uh, please uh, go to hosting.state.gov. Hosting.state.gov. And that will let you fill out a form showing that you're interested and then the forms will be distributed equally and fairly by American councils to a variety of organiz placement organizations. I'm going I'm to have a, an empty bedroom in a couple of years with s kids going off to college. <laughs> <laughs> this is very common, and, and uh, it's, uh, the host families have benefited so much by this, and one of the ways you can tell that is by the number who apply to, to mm -hmm. host a second time or a third time, uh -huh. saying this is... So that's typical that people, once they do very it, much, yeah. very much, and, and the benefit for, for siblings and community and other members of the family is towering. Now, you're here in the U.S. studying at Syracuse now. Uh, is that typical of, of people who uh, participate in any of these programs, flex your particular program, that they stick around and do study in the United States after? No, no, this is not you're a typical exception. case. I, I mean, I came back on a, a different international exchange uh, program, mm -hmm. actually also sponsored by the... A follow-up uh, program. Um, U.S. Department of State called Fulbright Scholarship. Uh -huh, sure. So, um, but I did my undergrad in Russia, and I, um, you know, after my, I returned from high school, I, you know, had to enter a college in Russia. I had to um, mm -hmm. re-enter my uh, life there, and I actually uh, had an a great opportunity to work with the American consuls in Russia, helping to recruit new flex students. And in general, the idea is that all the students come back and they share the ideas, the new ideas, uh, with their ho with their um, communities, home communities. And I had a great opportunity to work with a lot of alumni in Russia as a coordinator of their activities and uh, the things that they're doing uh, are just um, you know tremendous uh, the ideas that they bring back mm -hmm. I uh, I wouldn't have thought of all the things that they, the com as a community yeah. back home, uh, thought about and all the projects that we carried out together. Um, 
the reason I did come back on this other program was uh, purely out of my professional growth. You know, I worked uh, for six years at the American consuls and uh, with other NGOs, in fact, in Russia. And um, I felt that um, the Russian curriculum is not advanced enough to uh, give me the education that I needed. I looked at other options, too. I looked at Europe. I looked at the United States. Um, the fact that uh, public administration is strongest here uh, purely brought me back here for the master's program. But I'm going back now to work on uh, open government in Russia and uh, hoping to bring um, the ideas that I've learned in my program here back home. And is there a long-term goal? Um, professional goal? My professional goal to make uh, Russia a better place for everyone. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, uh, it's a I'm big goal, but uh, it's a <laughs> also an animal. Yes, um, uh, I, you know, I'm working. I'm. Um, hoping to uh, develop a s better civil society in Russia and it's been a challenge for our country uh, for a while now and I'm hoping to uh, contribute in a little way but uh, to a bigger cause. The, the, I'm, I'm guessing there's no one profile or, uh, of an alum, right? <laughs> they do a lot of different things but if you could share with us, each of you, mm -hmm. one of your favorite stories uh, of what someone has done after participating in right. one of these programs. Well, you know, um, there's one particular example. There's so there's several. I mean, the youngest member of the German parliament, uh, a woman, um, was uh, a CBYX. That's the German American Exchange that goes back to 1983. But a young man who participated in the Yes program from Ghana in Africa, he went back home and uh, you know he learned com he, he participated in community service and volunteerism here. And I just want to say that over the past three years, over one million hours of community service activities have been done by our you know high school foreign exchange students. Anyway, he went home using the skills he learned, volunteerism, community service raised $25,000 so he could put a well in in his village that's and right. bring fresh water there. Oh. So I, that's pretty heartwarming. Yeah, terrific. Dan, how about you? Well, what comes there, to mind? The, you know, there are 21,000 Flex alums and seven to 8,000. And so we, we all have our favorite stories. But I think, I think those that come to mind for me are uh, the, the young woman who was a Flex fellow here in the 1990s, very soon after the fall of the Soviet Union, when things were really quite in shambles. And uh, it was probably fair to say, Rosa, a difficult place to go back to in the mid-90s. And yet it's in the spirit of the FLEX program and the alumni of these programs that there's an optimism and a determination and an ability to say, this is just because things are tough right now, this is precisely why I can make a difference. I'm different and, and I can see how things could be better, rather than some sense of resignation or hopelessness, which sometimes can settle in uh, with people who have not been outside Side, can't really see behind. I behind imagine the this box. would be amazingly empowering. Yeah. And so, experience. just several examples come to mind. It's very, very hard to, play, to pick just one or two. But the young woman who went back and sort of looking at the state of Russian journalism mm -hmm. to take a, a field that's close to us all, and uh, saw the opportunity to create a truly open, independent journalistic entity in Russia that would behave like a normal, independent media presence in Russia and give people fresh accurate, reliable information that was not ideologically tinged, uh, but also met international standards. And that's sort of the trick, not just to do anything, but to meet international standards in the process. A young woman uh, has done that, and uh, she founded a, uh, ultimately a, t a television station and a, a network-based uh, system that is very, very, I mean, is, uh, uh, and visiting Russian friends this past mm -hmm. week, I found her, her programs were on in the homes of my friends. <laughs> so I know people are watching it. That's and uh, so, great so you know, and this is, this is, this, this is a kind of change that, that, that really matters. We have deputy ministers in government. We have a lot of people in the third sector because that's an area still of Russian civil society locally where you can make a difference. Some have gone into government and many, of course, in the education side. So it's, it's a huge kind of uh, spectrum yeah. of people working in almost every sector and making a difference. Well, well, thanks to all of you for sharing some good news. I have to say, often when you do programs like this, you're talking about problems. You're talking about war. You're talking about, it's nice to talk about something that's working and is, is. a positive thing all around. Mm -hmm. So congratulations and thank you for your involvement in it. Thank you. Thank you good luck as yes, uh, post-graduation. Thank you very much. When we return, we'll discuss President Obama's recent speech on climate change. Has it put the issue back on the agenda in a meaningful way? We'll find out what Ruth Greenspan Bell thinks right after this. The Wilson Center is America's living memorial to its 28th president, connecting the world of policymaking to practical options derived from the world's finest ideas, research, analysis, 
and honest nonpartisan conversation. Visit us on the web at wilsoncenter.org. And now we return to more dialogue at the Wilson Center. Welcome back. Ruth Greenspan Bell is a public policy scholar with the Wilson Center's Environmental Change and Security Program. I want to welcome you back to Dialogue, Ruth. Thank you. In the preview, we talked about the president's speech, but before I ask you about that specifically, I want to talk to you about your ongoing project, this notion of rebooting the climate effort, a research agenda and proposal. That's the official name on the Wilson Center website. <laughs> Sounds well, pretty official. It does sound very official. <laughs> so, uh, so how goes that project? And is this the big boost to those efforts that has been needed from the bully pulpit? Well, you know, I came to Wilson Center actually to work on climate change, frankly, in the back door. So my project is really thinking about how you might use behavioral insights, insights from behavioral social science research, to re-motivate how people manage and use energy. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, there are many, many paths to this goal, and, and this is just one of them. I, but it is heartening that the president is speaking about this and that's extremely helpful for all of us who are working on it. So I know you've, you've watched the speech a couple times. Yes. <laughs> so you'd be prepared to talk about it. And uh, put it in some context for us. What did you find most interesting about the speech? You know, when I thought about it, the president is kind of between a rock and a hard place on this thing. On the one hand, the science is pretty unequivocal. Despite what the deniers say, uh, there's pretty good consensus that, that we're heading into real problems, we're in real problems, and really the differences are really about uh, time and, and impact when these impacts hit and how bad they are. So on the one hand, he was very clear about the science. He was actually clearer than I recall any president being about climate science. On the other hand, the politics tend to be still pretty awful for him. And, you know, there are people who are already trying to capitalize on this speech, saying that it's going to make a difference in uh, the next Senate and House elections. So he's trying to walk between these kind of complex and, and hard to manage. Um, and, and when you say have an impact on the next election, a negative impact. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, the, the, there was an article in the Times in the last day or two indicating that, uh, that the Republican Party thinks this is a real opening for Vulnerability. Them. To yeah. talk about one of the great problems of our times on Spoken About, if you speak about it politically, it makes you vulnerable. That is their hope and expectation, and I guess we will just see. What about the uh, the advocacy community uh, f for action on climate change? Were, were they energized by this speech? Yes, absolutely. They were totally delighted that the president stepped out and did this. Um, he, uh, you know, again, he was very clear on the science, which is very helpful. He's outlined a plan. Now, you know, his People in his own administration, commenters on it, have you know, already commented that he basically articulated largely what's, what they're already doing in the administration, plus added some additional goals. Uh, and actions he can take independent of congressional well, action. Well, that's, that's, that's the key to this whole thing. Um, the assumption behind this is that this will have to go forward based on administrative actions, regulation under existing um, laws, the Clean Air Act, which he talked about at length, and um, using other, other tools he has and cooperating with states and cities who are also working hard on, on these issues. But, but as the new Secretary of Energy noted, that will be helpful and with, you know, retuning and, and working on, on the available uh, tools, they can make a lot of progress, but they also need to take those additional steps, and most of those additional steps will probably require legislation. Now, I unless you approach this issue as a, a political partisan, where you don't have to think about the science, you just have made up your mind based on your allegiance yeah. to your political affiliation, yeah. uh, it's, it's hard to not be moved by the science. And so th the question persists, and we've been talking about this on and off the air for a while now, is yeah. why no traction? Why do people not pay attention in a significant way. And I, and I want to ask you about a couple specific things. Is it the way that those who talk about climate change talk about it? Is it the wrong message and language? Is it the complexity of the issue? Or is it the well-funded denialism campaign? You know, I think it's a lot of all of that. I mean, one really important thing is that the, uh, the folks who have an interest in fossil fuels have a lot of money, and they've been putting a lot of money both into lobbying and into 
campaign finan into financing candidates and that's that's a big problem. And they don't have to convince people that it's not a problem. They just have to create confusion about what human action is uh, is what what's possible. Yeah, right? I mean they don't have to turn you completely against the notion that it's They've tried all of the above and and they, and they're very, you know, they've really ridden hard on the economy issue. Uh, whether this is going to be we whether, can afford this or whether, whether it would cost yes, jobs or things yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that, that's right. But, but there's also a more fundamental problem, which is that, you know, I was at a, at a conference of behavioral social scientists uh, in New York a few, a few weeks ago, and there was one interesting research um, that was presented that suggests that people have a hard time even imagining or kind of relating to their future selves, so who they're going to be in a couple decades, their older selves. And you know you see that, for example, in people's failure to um, save for retirement. Mm. You see that in spades in the climate issue because you know it's because what climate action requires is action now for results down the road. Because as the president pointed out, we already have this loading in the atmosphere, so we can expect carbon to increase in the atmosphere for some period of time, even if we somehow shut down all fossil fuels tomorrow. So what you're asking people to do is to invest today for future results. Never and an easy sell. It's a really hard Just sell. We, we're very short on time, shockingly. It's, it, it's gone too quickly, but in 10 seconds. Sure. But those who want action on climate change thought that maybe this pattern of extreme weather that we've been experiencing would be a catalyst for action. Why hasn't that caught people's attention? You know, I think it's caught people's attention where the weather has happened, but uh -huh. a lot of people, it's yeah, yeah, it's localized. Um, my daughter in California, who is very aware of these things, said that people in California were hardly talking about Sandy when it happened. Now, that was just her personal experience, but, you know, it, it does tend to be a very personal, localized experience. Well, again, I promise we'll come back to it, as we have before. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. That's all for this edition of Dialogue at the Wilson Center. Until next week, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for joining us. We'd like to hear from you. Please send your questions or comments to dialogue at wilsoncenter.org. You can also follow us on Facebook. Search Dialogue Television and Radio. Our host's Twitter feed is twitter.com backslash John Molusky. Dialogue is a co-production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars and MHZ Networks. Dialogue is available via broadcast, cable, satellite, and telco on MHC Worldview throughout the United States. To see how to watch where you live, visit www.mhcnetworks.org.